Welcome to the Week in IndyCar on the Marshall Pruitt Podcast, presented by Cooper Tires. Apologies for posting this a couple of days later than we normally do, and a bit of a fun and interesting scheduling bout with our pal and upcoming guest, Larry Foyt, who has been on lots of planes, tending to all kinds of important things, good things, with the AJ Foyt Racing Team's primary sponsor, ABC Supply. We'll get to Larry here in just a little bit. As usual, you all have sent in some great questions for me to get to first via Facebook, via Twitter, and Reddit. Also have a little bit of business right up front with our friends at TorontoMotorsports.com. Our good pal, Derek Koska, who gives out a t-shirt to whomever's question I like the most from the previous week's show. And we're going to do a first here. Actually, I love two questions. So I haven't told Derek this. Hey, Derek, thanks for listening. We're sending out two t-shirts this week. Uh, we're going to give one to Tom Schreier. Uh, last week, our awesome, awesome guest, Kara Adams, chief race tire engineer at Firestone. Uh, she, A, was amazing, and thank you for all the great feedback that was received uh, for having Kara on. We're going to do that more often for sure in the new year. Uh, but coming from the questions that were posed to us, we had one from Tom Schreier who said it would be interesting to hear what kind of feedback Firestone gets from drivers in general and who is the highest maintenance driver. And that just led to some fun conversating. No surprise that the French fry to my hamburger, Sebastian Bourdais, was listed as the highest maintenance driver to deal with in terms of tire feedback, but that's also a good thing. He's a perfectionist. They are perfectionists. So that's a good little uh, little marriage right there. So Tom, send me a DM with your address and t-shirt size and we'll get you sorted. Also going to send one to our pal Vincent Anderson, Vince and Wendy. Uh, they're always just incredible supporters of IndyCar in general and also big friends of, frankly, many drivers, many teams. Vince sent in a question that said, what efforts are you, Kara, and Firestone doing to get more young ladies interested in STEM and that also led to a great conversation that dove into Kara's specific and ongoing efforts to educate young men and women uh, of all colors, all everything, uh, hopefully to get them into some sort of science, technology, engineering, math, discipline, and maybe even into IndyCar in the near future. So Vince, same thing. Send me a DM with your address and your preference on t-shirt size, and our friends at torontomotorsports.com will get you a the Week in IndyCar cartoon t-shirt over to you here shortly. So thanks again for those two awesome questions, Vince and Tom. A couple of other quick things to cover off before we get to my questions. As I mentioned last week, we have our pal Dave Duzik, uh, who is holding a charity function yet again during PRI. This is on December 6th. And if you are at all interested and happen to be in the greater Indianapolis area, if you wanted to check out the Dave Duzik, D-U-S-I-C-K, foundation.org, you can learn all about this. Just a cool function, music, conversation, a couple of IndyCar drivers, some fun personalities. Max Pappas is going to be there, which means there's a, a, a serious possibility of nudity. Uh, Charlie Kimball will be there. You know, a lot of cursing. Possibly some breakdancing could be going on with Chuck. You never know what's going to happen, but all the money that they raise goes to the uh, the Riley Children's Hospital, and as a fellow member of the Cooper family, uh, just love Dave. Super guy. He, truly one of the, the greatest inspirations you're going to find on a daily basis on his various social media channels, and knowing that, like me, he's pretty fond of trying to find ways to help others. Well, when you can help others who are trying to help others, I guess that's just something that comes uh, comes naturally to uh, to me, wanting to make sure that Dave gets any recognition he can. So you might check out his link there. You can also head to iknowdaveduzik.com. He's got some great URLs. Uh, if you're interested in buying tickets to the event, that all benefits the Riley Children's Hospital. So this is another little bit of unsolicited fun. Uh, Miller's Indie Legends, that is plural, L-E-G-E-N-D-S, shirts, also plural, uh, indielegendsshirts.com. There's a pretty awesome new t-shirt here uh, of Mario Andretti's 1969 Indy 500 win done by our man, Roger Warwick, who does the cartoons for me and the little 
chubby MP running around or flying with a cat or whatever insanity that we happen to have. Uh, they got a great new t-shirt here, so just thinking out loud that if you want something for yourself because you know your family sucks and always gets you really lame Christmas gifts, or if you have folks that you love and know that with the 50th anniversary of Mario's Indy 500 victory on the horizon, that that would be something they would enjoy, check out Robin's site, IndieLegendsShirts.com. Why? Well, he and I are freelancers, right? You know, we're not saying we don't earn a good living, but we aren't exactly rolling Graham Rahal or Marco Andretti status buying new Porsches and Lamborghinis every week. So you buy a t-shirt, it puts a little bit of money in Miller's pocket, and the world is a brighter place. And there's a bunch of other great stuff. Uh, The site, you know, could use a little bit of development, but... If you scroll down to the bottom of the home page and click the Place Your Order Now button, that then takes you to a page where you can see all the other things they have for sale that you might want to order. So, although it's not on the front page, uh, click on the Place Your Order Now button, and then you get to see what you can order. So, anyways, if you love Miller, as I do, uh, you might check out IndieLegendsShirts.com and... uh, Send a little bit of Christmas tidings his way. So, with all that said, let's get into some of the great questions that you all have sent in for me. And we are going to start with Norm Nelson. This is a bit of a long one here, Norm. Uh, You're mentioning that, and I'll paraphrase because this is almost a page-long question and or comment. But you're noting that uh, you're working for a carbon fiber recycling facility... Uh, in Washington State, about two hours west of Seattle. I'm trying to think what two hours west of Seattle, I believe, would put you in the middle of the the Pacific Ocean. So, uh, anyways, maybe my geography is off. But uh, it says, we primarily take scraps of uncured, prepreg carbon fiber from the aerospace industry and turn them into products. And uh, Norm has mentioned that while attending the IndyCar race at Portland, Asked around, it seemed like all the IndyCar parts have to be ordered from Delara. Uh, looks like they have things locked up pretty tight, maybe, except for dampers. And he was asking if I know of any other ancillary carbon fiber parts that teams can buy from elsewhere. Would say that I believe, and I'm going to get an update here shortly from the series on any new areas they're going to open up for teams to, uh, to control or manufacture in 2019. There aren't many that come to mind here, Norm, that you might fill in and help. I would say if you are wanting to expand your business, which you did mention you want to do, and the fact that you're set up as a 501c3 not-for-profit, trying to keep all the carbon fiber out of landfills, uh, sports car racing might be a place to look to. Amateur racing in particular, SCCA club racing, NASA as well. Uh, The further you step away from pro racing, the less knowledge and capabilities uh, to make things out of carbon fiber exist. So, quick suggestion here for you is, since uh, your group has the ability to make lots of things using recycled carbon, uh, not that I would abandon if you have a desire to do such things on the pro level, but if you're looking for business... The, uh, the further you step away from the big series, I think the more success you'll have. Also knowing that there are a lot of well-proven uh, existing companies that provide those services. Mark One Composites, for example. Uh, friend Jeff Mowens, I mean, he's, he has been helping folks forever uh, in a variety of series. So there's already folks that fill that space. Just say you might look a little bit lower to find more opportunities. Let's go to Daniel Tripp next. He says, what would be the single biggest thing that could reduce the running cost of any lights. Engine package, uh, question mark. Would a change to the uh, crate, quote, stock block engine alleviate some of that? It would help, Daniel, uh, for sure. Back back in the day, I mean, for a super long time, super, super long time, stock blockish engines, that's all Indy lights happened to be. It was a Buick for the 80s, the 90s, and uh, into the 2000s. Uh, We also had, with the advent of the Infiniti Pro Series, a Nissan stock block uh, going to the turbo AER motor. 
you know, cost-wise, of course, uh, a small high-power turbocharged engine is going to require more specialist effort and uh, the costs associated with that than, say, just a big V8 lump uh, or V6 lump, which had been the uh, the preceding choice of engine. Uh, again, I don't... Is this an area where, of course, efficiencies could be found? Yes, no doubt. Is this the thing that I look at and say, boy, if you went to a different engine package, that is what would transform uh, the series, bring costs way down, drive up participation and entries? No, I don't. I also think, knowing how kind of on the rev limiter most Indy Lights teams happen to be in terms of budget, the concept of doing a motor swap right now, uh, and it's not just the engine itself, it's the electronics, it's the wiring, uh, it's the machining, it's the fit, and then potentially, depending on its size, since the current motor is a very small turbocharged four-cylinder power plant, uh, if you're going to something bigger, uh, meaning a naturally aspirated V6 or V8, it is going to be longer, it's going to be wider, uh, it is going to have a significant impact on performance and handling. So, and that's the whole another thing to consider of what else might have to change on the car to make it handle properly. So, this being one of the core components on the vehicle, I'd say it's kind of baked in as it is. Uh, in terms of what can be done to reduce costs, you know, in a grander scheme, I would say downsizing the amount of events on the calendar is always something to look at. The counter argument is, well, hey, we've got kids, we want them to get as many miles as possible. That is a great diversity of tracks, big ovals, small ovals, road course, street course, you name it. Do everything necessary to train them properly when they get to those uh, same tracks in big indie cars. Can't argue with that. That's the goal. That's the perfect model for indie lights. You also must modify that to suit the financial times. And if we are sitting in an era where big dollars and lots of drivers with proper budgets were walking around, then I would say the indie lights calendar would be vastly expanded and would go to more tracks. If we are in a time as we are right now, where not as many young and funded drivers are knocking on the doors of Indy Lights teams, what do you do? Do you still keep that bigger schedule that is hard to meet and satisfy financially? Or do you downsize? I think this is it's a maybe a, a bigger, more wide-ranging answer here, but that's the thing, Daniel, that I see motor racing in general really needs to start accepting, and that is to fluctuate with the market as it fluctuates, always being the series that has picked the number, where we have 18 races per year, 40 races, seven, whatever the number is. I realize that there's a whole bunch of things, data equity, familiarity, all kinds of things that we want to have to build consistency uh, into our sport. But... If we are in a time where money is short, do you maintain that, that bigger calendar at the expense of a seven car gr of then having a seven car grid? Or do you say, hmm, do we need to adjust, be more flexible to what we see as happening and adjust the number of events to really suit the paddock and to suit those that uh, have money to bring? If more people can afford a smaller amount of races, then... I think that's just something that really needs to be considered. Let's move to Anthony Pienta. This is Marshall. Let's have a race in current cars, but the drivers are actually team owners who used to drive. Who would win? They have to drive their own team machinery. He says, I count Michael Andretti, Bobby Rahal, Brian Herta, Larry Foyt, AJ Foyt, Chip Ganassi, Michael Shank, Sam Schmidt, Dale Coyne, Roger Penske, and, well, he says Ed Carpenter doesn't count because he's active, but who still has it? even considering age and beer bellies. Hmm. Well, of the non-Ed Carpenters uh, that you mentioned, Herta has really been the only one who's climbed back in and done any racing in recent years. A little bit of endurance racing. So I would probably go with Herta. High-speed Herta. Just because he's sharpened a little bit more than the others. Larry Foyt, who actually speak about this or will speak about this uh, coming up a little bit later. 
Larry didn't get to drive for all that long, but still was able to do some pretty cool things. AJ, uh, if he was able to, I am sure would still be competing. Uh, granted, maybe we need to, if this was a race among bulldozers, <laughs> I'd say AJ would win that or crash into a lake. Uh, Ganassi was much better than folks give him credit for. Even he plays down his abilities, but Chip was a pretty good race car driver back in the day. As was Shank, his career wasn't all that long, but he did fairly well. Sam Schmidt, another one in very similar similar vein as Shank, uh, also extremely good at what he did for as far as he got. Coin is another one who... You know, I'd love to see Dale back in a car. Just something. That would be a blast, knowing that he didn't get to do a lot of, of driving in, in high-caliber creations. Some of them were his, but he uh, he cobbled together. Uh, did get a chance to see some of that back in the day, and he always had to root for him. RP is another one. Roger was pretty darn good uh, back in the day. Uh, Bob Rahal recently, somewhat recently, uh, abandoned driving and racing, mostly in the vintage vein, but basically said, all right, I'm good. Michael Andretti, though, I still think if you wanted to, if you wanted to train and wanted to get back and involved, I don't know about road and street courses, I don't know if that really holds his interest, but if Michael wanted to come out and play on ovals, I, I, <laughs> I would absolutely rate him as a threat everywhere we went, uh, or would go. So, I'd say Hurt is the most ready, but if Michael wanted to do some training, get in shape for it, had the fire in his belly to do it, of everyone listed here, he's the one that I think could actually get back into uh, the win column today, even while into his 50s. Let's see, next one comes in from Robert Northway. He says, so me and my wife are planning to come from New Zealand. That is great news, Robert. To go to next year's Indy 500, we're going to be there for Carb Day uh, through the Monday after. We're also hoping to do Bump Day if the budget fits. It says we're big foodies, so my question is, what are the best places to eat while we are in that part of the world? What are the places you guys always have to go to get fed while in Indy? Um, I would say, I mean, the, the number one place that I hear about is a working man's friend, and, and I've had burgers there before. Robin Miller, frankly, he uh, <laughs> he tends to stop and bring in some pretty good food. Uh, the Workman's Friend is definitely, I would say, at the top of the list. Long's Donuts, there's always a, a fittingly long line there. That is the place to stop. Those donuts are probably more popular than anything Robin uh, contributes during the month of May because he tends to bring in one or two dozen long donuts each morning uh, to the media center, and folks just j run to grab themselves some warm, tasty goodness there. Uh, there's the traditional mug and bun, which, you know, go to your doctor first, uh, have them pull out the dipstick. If you're low, a few quarts of oil, uh, a few pints of oil, whatever measurement you prefer, uh, mug and bun will get you taken care of. Uh, it is the old school greasy spoon with grease and oil being one of the, the prime ingredients. Love the place though. Go once at least. Make sure you're not doing anything the next day. That's too far from a bathroom. Uh, <laughs> your body will want to uh, reject and expel, whether it's the uh, pork tenderloin sandwich or the chicken tenders or the onion rings, whatever it is, you got to go there. Uh, it's just a little bit nuts. Uh, I don't know if you are a fan of root beer. They make their own root beer, Robert. That is the one thing that, while I try to avoid... Uh, the mug and bun, since I've been there a few too many times over the years, but their root beer is something that, oh, it's it's purely divine. And maybe there's some others, some other places to go to. I'll admit that I try and stick to a more simple diet while there, so there'll be a couple of exceptions, a day or two where I'll uh, indulge, but uh, really try and actually eat fairly consistent, uh, at fairly consistent places that aren't that exciting. So... Uh, but maybe some other folks can offer some ideas here on the good old interwebs uh, and you know, send some notes or suggestions on places you might attend, Robert, for you and your wife to have some dining pleasure while in Indy. Next question comes in from Doug White, and uh, this is also posed a little bit later to Larry in one of the questions that have come in for him. Doug asks, why dampers? Of all the things that could be open, 
why the least visible items to the fan, and maybe the most difficult to appreciate, Penske lobbying perhaps, and I think the last comment there is related to the fact that uh, Penske shocks have been part of the industry for decades. Uh, why shocks? Very much, Doug, just a, a matter of point with the IndyCar series when it was launching the DW12 for 2012, wanting to keep everything locked down, costs low, big concerns coming out of a recession that hit in late 2008 and definitely hung around and scared folks through the next couple of years. So if you think about the timeline of when the next generation IndyCar was announced in 2010 and then confirmed and developed in 2011, then coming online, we're still in a period where the economy was shaky. A lot of folks were fearful that prices would be going up and also knowing that the chassis that were being used were you know, eligible for vintage racing. No joke at the time they were competing in IndyCar. So I think just the general mindset was, hey, uh, what can we leave open that isn't going to create a massive wildfire of spending? And so rather than letting uh, bodywork be open, rather than letting transmission development, suspension development in terms of everyone make your own uh, suspension altogether. I think they just said, okay, damper seems to be uh, the easiest choice because it's one area on the car where there are a couple of solutions that are ready-made. Meaning, you know, in some areas, not, if we look at the gearbox, for example, I know that they receive tenders uh, to supply them from Emco, for example. They went with X-Track. Uh, Hewland, I believe, uh, might have submitted something. There were a couple of options, but I would say if we're talking real high-tech, modern, just industry standard, they went with X-Track because that's what X-Track happens to be. Large volume, high quality, uh, high power motor racing transmissions, that's something where you're, there's a zillion X-Track gearboxes available. That's what IndyCar chose to use as the sole supplier. Dampers, uh, it's an area where you go, hey, there are a couple of them between Penske and Olean's and, you know, some modifications that teams have done to a variety of other damper bodies throughout the years. There are a couple options here. Teams already have them and or have relationships with those vendors. Let's just leave that open and let them continue to play. The uh, permission of using inerters within the dampers was also given the green light. So, no argument whatsoever. Why dampers? We can't even see them. Why would this be something that they left open that fans, you know, really can't see and probably don't care about? I can't argue with that point. I uh, would just say that, naturally, whatever was going to be left open, if something was going to be left open, whatever it was, was going to be the thing that received a huge amount of focus from the teams. And so while we hear costs of dampers, and oh my gosh, it's crazy, and how could so much money be spent on these things if they locked down dampers and opened up something else, uh, opened up the drive system a bit, not just, you know, I'm not talking gear ratios, but inside the fun stuff, hey, do whatever you want uh, within the, the quote, differential housing. Uh, <laughs> the same, if not more, if not five or ten times the amount of money would be spent there. So while I get the dampers have maybe gotten a bit of a bad rap, boy, way too expensive, can't see them, it's dumb, unless it's bodywork, um, for the most part, any other part that would be opened by IndyCar is probably not going to be all that visible or easily distinguishable uh, to the, the you know, average fan looking at a car 20 or 30 or 40 feet away. And those things would also receive a massive, a massive amount of R&D expenditure. So it's just a function of whatever's left open is going to get a lot of money. It's going to become ridiculously expensive. So if they do lock down dampers, okay. Uh, if they do open up something else, that's going to be the next thing. So it's just kind of chasing, <laughs> chasing the open item with money to differentiate themselves uh, from team to team and car to car. Let's move to a couple other questions here. We have, I beat the chief, sent in by Reddit, uh, saying, where do the majority of old IndyCar chassis end up, and why is there no vintage series of any significance? Uh, on the first one, you know, I would say that 
if we're talking modern era, we've had the vast majority of the Champ car chassis, the Pianos DPO7s, uh, or DPO1s, I apologize. I always forget the, the numerical designations. I believe it's DPO1. Uh, we always have uh, things like that either go into private hands, stay with teams, or there's a big acquisition of a fleet. We did have that happen where Ben Johnston bought uh, most of the old uh, panos, the 2007 Champ cars, Champ car chassis, had a desire to do his own series, fell apart. Uh, I believe he failed to pay or something happened where storage of those cars uh, basically led to them being put up for sale uh, because whatever bill was not paid to retain them. And so those have kind of leaked back out and some have been purchased and whatnot. So that's great. If we look at, you know, the current IndyCar stuff, well, the previous generation Delars, the IRO3s and IRO7s, some of the G-forces and whatnot, you see a lot of those uh, have either turned into promotional cars, something that teams will do up in whatever livery uh, represents their latest sponsors and use those uh, for promotional means. And in some instances, you just see them go up for private sale. It's always fun when you find a 2004 Dallara or whatever on eBay or uh, bring a trailer or something silly like that. There's no real single conduit for what happens, though. Teams will often hold on to them. We know that uh, Chip Ganassi Racing has their wall of cars. It's a, it's a great thing to behold where they do hold on to them. So there's no real one single answer, but we do see that Hopefully, more and more are going to be uh, made at least runners to be used. As for there being no vintage series of any significance, the uh, the good folks, our pal Mike Lashman, he's part of a group, and along with Grant King and the, the Turn 4 restorations and such, they have been doing some, I would say, some very good stuff in recent years uh, with their little organization, that being the Vintage Indie Registry Group, where Gateway, for example, they have, uh, they are one of the key support series, but they do try and get together and bring out a wide variety of old indie cars. You know, they will lap the uh, the 500 on, uh, you know, the couple days before the race itself, Carb Day, get to see them and such. So there's a little bit going on there. Not claiming that there's a ton. It's actually one of my bigger complaints about the larger vintage festivals that get held here in the U.S., whether it's Walter Mitty, the Rolex Reunion out here in Monterey or wherever, that, you know, what are you going to get? You're going to get 90, whatever, seemingly 90% of sports cars, something with roofs or fenders covered. And if it's not that, then great, you'll get some smaller open wheel cars. Uh, you'll get some, some cool stuff there too, but there just does not seem to be a dedication or desire to really make Vintage indie cars, a common part of uh, vintage, greater vintage racing events. So, something that I definitely, definitely hope changes here in the near future. Let's get to the last couple of questions you had for me here. Up next, we have Brent1722, who says, Nothing gets my blood boiling more than when fans say they want multiple manufacturers for tires, air kits, chassis, etc. When there are multiple manufacturers, then they complain about the disparity between cars. Remember people when you wanted different air kits for Honda and Chevy? How did that go? Don't listen to the fans, IndyCar, because what fans think they want and what they are like are totally different. Uh, I get it. Just say that the current way things are structured, all about cost reduction, all about simplification in the name of keeping costs low, so we get a lot of spec things, and we have come to expect things to be close. Then when we open things up a little bit, in this case with aero kits, we had one manufacturer that did a much better job than the other, and they beat the heck out of the other manufacturer, that being Chevy doing a much better job than Honda. Um, I don't prescribe to this don't ask for things to be different mindset, Having grown up in an era where spec things just weren't a thing, <laughs> we really, we really didn't know that that wasn't. It just wasn't part of the culture. It wasn't something folks knew. You had different everything. Uh, folks made their own chassis. Some tried to make their own engines. We had different tires. Different, you name it. All kinds of different. And 
I, although that isn't where we are today, I would just hate to lose that. So I actually would completely disagree here. I mean, respect your opinion, but mine is 100% the opposite. Uh, I don't ever want for us collectively to give in and just say, okay, make them all the same. I mean, if we just continue this trend, we say, cool, let's go back to a single engine supplier. If we, if we do not want to care about the cars, if technology advancement, creativity, if we just want to surrender, then let's go back to what we had. Uh, with all, pick the name, you know, it could be a Honda engine, could be Chevy, could be someone else. At, at that point, does it even need to be a manufacturer? It'd just be a generic engine, maybe, you know, crate motors uh, with no name on the cam covers. I mean, just saying, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think I will ever get to a place where I believe that sameness is just the best thing or, or the thing that we should have. Uh, I can tell you that when we had, the last time we had a lot of manufacturers to choose from, again, across tires, chassis, engines, you name it, um, there was also an, a widespread understanding among teams and the fan base, maybe more fans than teams, that, hey, you know, racing is supposed to be like any other sport. There are no guarantees. This isn't about minimizing the chance of ever making a wrong decision it's the same thing with your favorite football team, basketball team. They make choices each year. Who do we put on the roster? Who starts? Uh, who sits on the bench? What's the right combination? Um, some get it right, some get it wrong. Teams have ups and downs. I mean, I'm fortunate out here that my Golden State Warriors have been kicking butt. Are they going to win three in a row? Are they going to implode? Did losing JaVale McGee... Uh, is that going to be something that really upsets them now that they don't have a big man who can score consistently uh, whenever he is on the court? Again, it's some of these things where you go, you know, you have choices, and how you make your choices and others make their choices will directly affect how competitive you are. Bizarre to me to think that we've gotten to a place in racing where the, hey, no, 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 take all decisions away from us. We don't want to have decisions. Uh, then it's just truly down to, well, what engineers do we have? What mechanics do we have? Uh, the drivers, obviously, most drivers in IndyCar are in similar talent grade, you could say. A couple of truly exceptional ones. Uh, the bulk, the absolute meat in the sandwich are all chasing them. And then there are a couple that are stragglers. But you know, for the most part, it's just bizarre to think that, you know, hey, let's keep pushing this sport in a completely unique place where no other sport lives, where we don't want choices, we want everything spec, and that's okay. I don't know. I mean, when I turn on to watch sports, I want to see excellence, unique people, individuality, creativity. That's something we had in racing. We don't have it so much now in IndyCar. I get that. I understand it's the era we are in. I just hate to see us just truly surrender. It's okay. That's the way it'll be. It's just going to be essentially tools that people drive in that we don't care about and don't matter to us anymore. So anyways, I hope we actually don't go in that direction, but it's not up to me to decide. We'll go to Ryan Ward next. It says, Marshall, I'm currently on a cross-country RV trip from San Jose to Washington, D.C. That sounds like fun. It says, while hauling, hauling ass across the southern states on I-40, I noticed while going 70 to 80 miles an hour, and passing large semis, that what I would call is air wash, not sure if that's the correct term, is so bad from the semi that it pushes me towards the hard shoulder. I said I have to counter steer into the semi just to stay straight. I said the air wash is so bad that even while the road is turning left, I have to steer the wheel to the right uh, into that semi that I'm passing. Uh, it's truly a manhood testing experience. Is this what happens to Indy cars? as they pass each other heading down the front straight at Indy, uh, or am I experiencing something totally different? Um, I'd say you are experiencing a highly, highly exaggerated version of it. Uh, if you think about the sheer amount of air being shoveled off of the front of a semi into the uh, RV that you are driving, it's a massive wall of air that is being diverted and hitting whatever is next to it and yeah, that amount of air is going to move you for sure. I would say in the IndyCar stuff in particular, if we think about the Indy 500, 
Of course these cars are, are punching a hole through the air. Of course they're making downforce. Of course there's drag being produced, that turbulence. We also have these cars that have been designed from the outset to be as aerodynamically pure as possible, to leave as little disruption behind them, uh, even out to the sides as they can, wanting to pierce through the air like an arrow instead of a brick. So you're getting the brick effect. And yeah, <laughs> I've been, you know, I've, I've towed big, big things all throughout the country for race teams, you know, while working for race teams many, many, many times and know exactly what you're talking about where, uh, yeah, I mean, and you're in a single vehicle, an RV, uh, yeah, having to do that while towing a fifth wheel, uh, with, you know, in it, sitting in a dually towing a big tall fifth wheel behind it uh, and having to feed some opposite lock to <laughs> keep yourself from uh, running into other cars or falling off a cliff, yeah, that does test manhood. Uh, I'd say another thing, I'll just throw in kind of a fun anecdote as well. It's not IndyCar, but it's sports cars, but uh, definitely relates to air being shoveled off the front of the car and how it affects those uh, along the sides. Joey Hand, who drives for the Ford Chip Ganassi Racing GT team, it's just interesting listening to him say, hey, you know, one of the things that I do at Le Mans on the long Mulsanne straights or any long straight if I'm having a, a really close battle with a competitor in the GTE class, he says, I use a trick that I learned from a friend who races in NASCAR. And he says, if we're side by side, we're essentially equal coming out of a corner and have a long straight to blast down to before we get to the next corner, before we decide who's going to get there first or outbreak one another. He said, well, you know, the thing that I learned is instead of just sitting there side by side, which can often happen, you essentially stall out, it says you need to do one of two things. Uh, you need to either get ahead just a little bit or position yourself where the front of your car uh, is basically feeding air into either the front or the rear fender well of the car that's alongside you. So it's just truly about placement and using either a little bit of acceleration. Uh, try not to become the car behind that's getting the, uh, the fender wheels packed with air bleeding off the side of the competitor. But he said, essentially, uh, what I try and do is get myself in a position where I can just nose ahead a, a little bit and try and get the angle right and the, the distance between my, the side of my car and the side of their car so the air coming off the front of mine is aimed and essentially uh, just packing right into one of their fender wells. And he says it just acts like a very small parachute, but just enough for them to start falling back further and further. So when I'm able to do that, he said, I don't have to turn this into a bravery thing when we get to the chicane or whatever it might be, see who can outbreak one another. I can just use the air coming off the front of my car and essentially aim it in a very disadvantageous place to slow down the guy that I'm racing. Let's go to another Reddit question. Soy Murcielago says, Marshall, in the interest of the holiday season, and you being relatively close with most of the IndyCar field, are there any unique or special holiday tra traditions in IndyCar, as I try and speak words with my mouth, uh, or any driver that have unique traditions? For example, does DJ Willie P host a Christmas rave or something similar to merit that moniker? I'm curious to hear about how our favorite series celebrates the winter away. Uh, be real honest here, I haven't stayed that close to this topic for a little while. I know that anecdotally, uh, there used to be more of a collegial, hey, let's get together as a group and do things, uh, whether it's a team or just clusters of friends of drivers getting together to do fun things. I think that's decreased a little bit more and more uh, in recent years. would say that with the retirement of some of the, either the, I should say the retirement of the moving on to other series from some of the bigger names, maybe those who are no longer living in close proximity to uh, other IndyCar drivers, times of getting together, putting on big bashes and such, become less of a thing. This is pretty boring answer. Maybe a driver will reach out and tell me that uh, I've missed what they're doing that's truly unique, but most of what I've heard about uh, in recent years is just drivers wanting to have downtime with family. So instead of this being a big, unique tradition, I think instead of doing something big, uh, most of what I've heard about is, hey, we want to be just no different than anyone else. Downtime, family time, celebrate, be a normal human being 
who doesn't have a bunch of PR obligations or testing or whatever else. Just this is what we want normalcy instead of putting on something big and crazy. But I do like the idea of power holding a rave. That might be a little, little bit crazy. Let's go to another Reddit question, Bobby Gondo, who says, Hey, Marshall, if Alonso does a road course before the 500, and it's either Kota or the Indy GP, and you had to predict a finishing position, what would your guess be? A couple of caveats here, Bobby. Depending upon the engineers working with the team, whether they are experienced in IndyCar and with this 2018 spec UAK bodywork, you know, if we're talking about McLaren has all the right information and or you know borrowed, say, from an Andretti team, which they're working with, from Chevy, which they're working with, or you know, have staffed up with engineers that know the cars and can help expedite, you know, the competitiveness of someone like Fernando. Uh, if we assume that one or more of those things are in place and the team itself is capable of handing Fernando a car that is, uh, has the potential of being towards the front, uh, uh, podium, for sure. <laughs> podium, if not a win. Uh, yeah, I'd say some of his newness, if we're talking road course, whether it's the need for fuel saving, uh, whether it is just the, the working the tools within the car to get the, uh, the handling correct throughout the course of a race, uh, giving the engineer feedback on what's needed to tune the car. You know, we're talking primarily tire pressure and such, but you know, at each stop, uh, when to go on to, if we're again talking a road course here, when to go on to reds versus blacks or blacks versus reds, there's some of those little things that obviously Fernando would be lacking to uh, to nail perfectly each time. But if we just threw all that stuff away and said, all right, if Alonso is in a highly competitive car, how would he do? If he's not on the podium, I'd be shocked. This is one of the world's greatest living motor racing, living and active motor racing drivers. Bar none. Uh, I've said, and I've got a little bit of flack, but fun that's expected that uh i while i rate lewis hamilton an all-time great in equal machinery i don't know how often he would finish ahead of fernando alonso i realize they were teammates back in the day i realize there's a whole backstory there but just looking at who and what fernando is there's a steeliness to his approach right now that i like there's also a bit of lightness to it as well so it's this really hyper determined angle that I'm seeing in him, even more maybe than we had at some points uh, when he was driving for McLaren or Ferrari before that, but he also seems to have relaxed a little bit at the same time. It's a weird kind of place where I think he's been able to, you know, inhale and exhale, clear his mind, and get back to that kind of inner monster, inner rage thing that really drove him to greatness, especially the last dec a decade ago. So with all that said, if he's in a position to be competitive on a road course podium, if not a win, I mean, that's how good he is, barring any mistakes or not fully understanding any of the minutia that might help get him into victory lane. Yeah, uh, the guy's an automatic uh, podium expectation. Same thing in Formula One. I mean, drop him into a Mercedes, a Ferrari, you name it. It's the same thing. Drop him into anything where he can, where he wouldn't be a fish out of water. NASCAR, on an oval, of course, we would not expect something similar, but drop him into uh, sports cars, put him in anything where he can just be himself and do what he does. Yeah, the guy's one of the greatest in the world. Uh, biggest interest here, for me at least, would be where does a Scott Dixon measure up against him? Where does a couple of other of our big stars, where do they measure up against him outside of an oval, things where... You know, our, call it, people have a great amount of expertise and specialty. But on a road course, a Kota, actually the Indy GP I think would be fun because that's a place that would be, instead of uh, fully to his advantage since he's been to Kota many times, he'd figure out the Indy GP course in 1.5 laps. But love to see how things would go there. That would be brilliant. And I believe that will happen. Uh, if the McLaren team were to rock up and just start running at practice for the Indy 500, that would be the shocker. Final question here, a little bit of a fun one and saved it for last. This comes in from Senina27 in reference to the great Ayrton Senna. 
asks, what are your recommendations for racing-related books over the winter? I know you have a ton of biographies and histories on your shelves. Which should I read next? It doesn't have to be IndyCar. Uh, I watch every form of racing imaginable. All right, well, let me turn my head a little bit and, and look at some that I would suggest. I also have a couple of books that have shown up. I haven't actually opened up the boxes yet from my friend uh, that I bought from the uh, Motorsport Collector in Chicago. I know John Barnard, the uh, great, great chassis designer, uh, designer of the yellow submarine IndyCar, um, designer of so many great and amazing things. His, uh, his book I just got. I believe I also got Adrian Newey's book, so there are a couple that I just need to open. Uh, let's see. Well, here's one uh, that I, I think I mentioned recently. There's a cool book. I think I mentioned it in Robin's mailbag, and I'm grabbing it. Apologize for the sounds here, and I think I even misspelled her name because I'm an idiot. Sylvia Wilkinson uh, has put out a new book titled 5050, the story of champion race car driver John Paul Jr. and his battle with Huntington's disease. It's a really good read. Uh, I have gotten through most of it, and it's a fine, fine book. Would suggest that among the new offerings. Uh, my pal Sean Cridland and Hurley Haywood worked together on Hurley's autobiography that I'm staring at here, titled Hurley from the Beginning. It is magnificent. Uh, Hurley being a one-time Indy 500 starter. Uh, we spoke about that on a podcast. I'm not sure how long ago. I'll try and remember, but you might listen to that. That was a lot of fun. But Hurley's life and career, just truly fascinating. Uh, you know what I would recommend, maybe, and this is probably more of a eBay search. You probably call the Motorsport Collector, maybe our friends, uh, torontomotorsports.com, if you uh, are more Canadian-based. Never against going back in terms of books and IndyCar content. Uh, I have... An entire shelf, which actually I need to expand because I've, I've acquired more, but I'm staring at a lot of old Carl Hungness, uh, Hunganis, uh, Indy 500 annuals from the 60s and 70s, uh, 80s as well, uh, looking at some of the Indy review books that I believe IMS helped uh, make happen. There's a bunch of great cart annuals from the 80s that you can purchase. Auto Course, the folks who... Uh, involved with auto sport back in the day. Uh, they did a wide range of yearly annuals on cart that I have, I think, through the late 80s, all throughout the 90s, into champ cart era and such. Just say that if you're a fan of the sport, one of the reasons that, as you mentioned, my bookshelves are full, if you think about the internet and the internet age, it's awesome. It's amazing. It also coincided, you know, uh, at a point where IndyCar was 70 years old, 80 years old, however old it was. It's a lot of stuff. Just a crazy amount of stuff. That happened. That is not on the interwebs. And, you know, you can pull up a racingreference.com or, or sites like that and see who finished where on what day at a particular race. One of the things that I love about going after old-timey books, uh, erasing annuals, you name it, is the context and the stories and the reporting uh, just being able to crack open if I although I was there if there's something I have forgotten about the 1995 cart season I'm staring at the uh, auto course IndyCar official yearbook for 1995 where it has reports on every single race where qualifying and practice and the results were uh, just you name it wonderful resources that not only help me in a professional standpoint today, but also just help for those who are maybe newish or newer to the sport. You go, hey, you hear a lot of what we talk about is history, this immense IndyCar history, you know, for, I don't know what the number is, five bucks, ten bucks, something, either through a, a memorabilia store that still has some, or an eBay or similar, you can buy them and say, hey, I now know uh, everything there is to know about the, I'm staring at the hungness, 1993 Indianapolis 500 yearbook. Uh, I went through that thing extensively this year while putting together stories about what happened 25 years ago at the 500. Just thoroughly recommend uh, considering delving back into IndyCar's history from a book standpoint and becoming your own expert or filling in any gaps that you might have or uh, satisfying any curiosities that you might have. Beyond that, I mean, <laughs> a lot of cool autobiographies. Uh, my pal David Malsher, who I worked with at Racer for a long time, and uh, although he's 
part of a different media outlet. We're still close pals. His book that he did with Will Power, it's a fine piece. It's a fine piece of writing there that is somewhat new. Uh, maybe the last one that I'm looking at here, and this is if you are into some of the, uh, I would say, less known but equally as important uh, times in IndyCar. There's a glorious book titled For Gold and Glory about the African-American, uh, call it IndyCar series, the, the offshoot IndyCar series since uh, drivers of color were not invited to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway to compete for a really, really long time. It's a beautiful book. And there's also a, there's a documentary that goes along with it that was on PBS. Uh, I think I have that videotape or DVD or something somewhere, but that book... Uh, boy, if you're just a fan of trying to learn about some things that aren't common, it's not talking about the time that, uh, you know, Johnny Rutherford won this race or Emerson Fittipaldi did here at this race that is just kind of a, a better known thing. Yeah, sometimes I love looking into aspects of our sport that uh, just add more character, add more knowledge uh, that maybe extends beyond the common conversational topics. And with that said courtesy of our friends at Cooper Tires. Let's get into our conversation with Larry Foyt. Larry, really, really happy to have you on. I believe this is your first week in IndyCar visit. We've done a podcast or two before on a couple of things, but thanks for finding some time here. I know you have been running around the country busy as heck doing uh, really cool and fun stuff related to your primary sponsor, ABC Supply. So, Thanks for uh, carving out a little bit of time to connect with my audience and IndyCar fans who are very thankful to have you. Absolutely. Great to be here with you, Marshall. Always love chatting with you. All right. Well, we got a couple of different little categories I've come up with based on the questions that have come in. Why don't we go with, maybe it's a little bit of a, a softball to start. It's not meant to be. It's just a good question for those who aren't aware. First one comes in from Michael Oglesby who says, how did the ABC Supply relationship come to fruition, and why has it been so successful? Uh, great question. Um, and actually, when when the ABC deal started, I was actually living in Charlotte still at the time. I was just closing up the NASCAR stuff I was doing, doing out there. So I wasn't really involved on any of the management side or putting that deal together. That was really AJ and the... Uh, Ken Hendricks and uh, the uh, CEO at the time, David Luck. So, so that was. Uh, I, I know um, there was a driver involved at the time. I think Scott Mayer was going to come, and I did. I remember shaking down the ABC car for him, and then he was doing some practice stuff. But I don't think they ended up uh, actually entering him. But I know AJ had already had uh, had a relationship with Ken Hendricks uh, and, and Diane Hendricks, and that's how it started. And it's just been uh, really just the merging of two companies that are, have similar ideals. I mean, they're just, you know, it doesn't get much more uh, American than A.J. Floyd. And ABC Supply obviously has a huge American pride and, and just hard work. A lot of that, I think, the ideals that, that ABC has and, and A.J. shares those with them. So it's been a great relationship. We do so many things. Uh, like, yeah, like you said, we were with them yesterday. We just got done. We, we retrofitted some old Indy cars with some, actually, we put some uh, Mazda Miata engines in them, and they have an automatic <laughs> gearbox that we built for it. And uh, the ABC guys come down, and we, we go down to MSR, and, and they get to drive the Indy cars, and we just have a blast. So we do a lot of fun things. We do a lot of ABC hunting trips down at our, our hunting ranch in Del Rio. So just a lot, just, you know, we, there's a lot of off-track stuff uh, that goes on with the on-track stuff that everybody doesn't see, but really makes the program work. That's maybe, that's maybe an area that most fans don't get to hear about that much. On the surface, and we'll get into this a little bit later because we have some questions separated into kind of a team improvement, getting back into victory circle. Obviously, you and everyone involved in the team have been working hard, making a lot of changes in recent years to try and get back to being that front-running contender. Some might say, well, hey, ABC Supply, from a value standpoint, you know, if you aren't winning races, then uh, what is a team presenting in terms of value? And 
it's just interesting. I think it's interesting, Larry, for folks to hear more about the fact that, yes, performing well on track is an important piece of the relationship, but if that's the only aspect of the relationship, uh, sponsors are going to be coming and going across every team at some point in time. Sure, sure. I mean, we're just, uh, you know, haven't been with them. It's going to be great, and we're going into our 15th year, so... We just do we do a lot of stuff together. They really use the racing program and a lot of their even in a lot of their business meetings and and presentations, we really tie it all together. And uh, just just we're really, you know, two two kind of family run companies that are very close uh, close together. I don't want to say they're family run, but they they're such a, a big company and they do so well in their industry, but they really try to stick to their values and their core values and that's just what what makes it work and obviously aj's uh a true self-made man like a like a lot of the the uh managers and people that have, have come up through abc supply so it just it just really works and and the on-track track stuff is important don't get me wrong i mean we're we are working hard to turn it around obviously uh leading the indy 500 with tony was was a highlight and i know that was exciting for for all the abc people that were at indy but we we certainly got i felt like we started the year well but then we missed it whatever the directions we were headed as the year went on we we seemed to fall behind performance wise so certainly gonna certainly been a busy winter like you said of the you always think during the season boy can't get any busier busier than the indycar season but then the off season you think well i'll take some time off but uh it certainly it doesn't end up that way (laughs) Let's see. Let's go to Ralph Hibbard. Hey, Ralph, he says, are there any tracks that you ran in NASCAR, Larry, that aren't on the current IndyCar schedule that you think might be a good fit or uh, a track that IndyCar might consider, at least, for the future? Oh, wow, that that is a good question. That's one I hadn't uh, thought about. Um, I would have to give that one some thought. I mean, uh, you know, I hate that we're losing Phoenix. Yeah. Uh, that uh, that's a shame. I'd love to see one more oval on the schedule just to help balance it out just a little bit more, so that there's plenty to choose from. I mean, uh, I certainly know. I thought we had some great races at Kentucky and places like that. But, yeah, uh, I gotta agree on Kentucky for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so it's a tough, you know, it, it's a tough call. It's, uh, I think, um, the IndyCar management they're doing a great job at making the our schedule makes sense and where we go i know they work hard on that and it's tough because all these tracks everyone everyone involved has their own agenda and trying to put those pieces together i know are tough for mark and jay but they're doing a really good job at it i'll throw atlanta out there i mean the irl used to go there back in the day and uh, but i would just say you know I, atlanta was just always a blast crazy speed uh just kind of crazy altogether so yeah uh, but i'm weird i guess i like Large, that is a, that is a. I mean, I tell you that that was a fast place. I remember racing racing my NASCAR, NASCAR race there. And I was so loose, and you know, you know how long those races are. You know, so it's about an, an hour and a half in, two hours. I'm just hanging on to this thing, so I'm worn out. You know, just tired from catching it all day long. And, uh, I, and then uh, the engine blew up, but I was like, "Holy crap! I should have thought about that a long time ago." <laughs> that would have made this day a lot nicer. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Let's see. Let's go back to a question. We've got a couple versions of this. I'll go with the one that Howard Bennett sent in, and it's coming back to ABC Supply, but I love the the angle about this. He says, uh, the Foyt racing car in ABC Supply colors uh, has to be currently the best-looking single-seater livery running anywhere globally. Uh, he says, could you guys discuss the design process? Who does it? Who are the graphic designers responsible? And might there be any design tweaks uh, to the cars? For the next season, and that, I know that's something you hear a lot, Larry. The wow, those cars look pretty darn awesome. Well, no, I appreciate that. It, you know, we we feel the same way, and it's uh, and that's why the livery stayed pretty constant. You know, it, it seems like we do we try to come up with new stuff uh, in the off season, but we just keep going back to my gosh, it's it's kind of hard to make this better right now. The one thing we did do, uh, and the guys responsible, they're a great uh, design company called Kane Co, and they do a, a fantastic job on it for us and uh, we did do the color reversal with Mateus's car so that was something kind of new but um, it still it doesn't really pop out that much because the colors are the same but when you do look at it I know it at a first glance it's 
sometimes hard to tell the difference, but there's still the colors are reversed between the two cars. And um, but yeah, we we always look at trying to do something different, but we haven't hit on anything we feels better yet, so we've kept it pretty constant. Well, you might freak people out and do uh, some sort of crazy. I think Penske has the Menards neon yellow taken but you know you might go for some sort of crazy neon blue and, and red just to really freak people out for one race that would be uh i'd buy that model larry i guess i can at least commit to that up front uh let's see let's go to jameen tuttle who asks a question i guess about a driver that uh he is fairly fond of uh asks is there any chance of having connor daly back in the team at some point and obviously you've got two really really solid full-time drivers so maybe jameen is thinking more Indy 500 or something like that, but that might be an interesting thing to uh, to explore, Larry, because in racing, it's not uncommon for drivers to come and go from teams. In some instances, a departure is truly a closed door for whatever reason. Uh, how do you regard Connor? Is he someone that, if the opportunities lined up, you uh, would welcome having him back? Yes, I mean, I mean for sure. I, I don't think anything ended badly between us and Connor. I mean, uh, and it's just something that if, if the right deal came about, I'm, I'm sure it could. Uh, so I, I'd love to see him in IndyCar full time. I, I do think he's deserving, and uh, so no, uh, uh, we'd love to have Connor back sometime if if the pieces fell in the right way. You know, it's just with with IndyCar racing, like everything else, you're just it's it's a it's a big you know it's it's business, and sometimes things work out, and sometimes they don't. I mean, he he was in a tough situation with us with switching to Chevy and all that, and uh, so but he but he still uh, had a great attitude and did a good job. Very capable driver. So you never know. I mean, that's one thing I've learned in IndyCar is I I certainly try not to burn any bridge because things can certainly come full circle in a hurry in IndyCar. So uh, I think everything ended amicably. We're still friends. I always try to say hi to him when i see him so i don't know he may not feel the same way about oh, me but that's no, not feeling no. about him no i know <laughs> no he still has uh would i know he would love to be back so i mean granted i always tell him to go away when i see him but i think that's just normal uh let's go to ken uh nathan cook's question you curious about what you might have seen difference wise either in performance or just uh interactions between both Chevy and Honda, knowing that at least in recent years you've worked with both brands. So just curious from the team side, is there anything that stands out uh, from being a part of one family or the other? Or if you have found that they're both pretty darn good and line up almost the same way? Uh, sure. Well, I'd, I'd say they're, they're both great to work with. Um, we certainly have, have really enjoyed the recent years here with Chevrolet and they did a fantastic job at the Indy 500 this year. So um, that was something that obviously is big for for our team, and we were really happy and proud of the work they did. And and certainly they they're trying to help us get reach our goals, and which will help the whole Chevy family reach their goals. I think so. Um, you know, not trying to sound too politically correct, but I think both groups work super hard. Obviously. Honda's done a good job to, to gain what, what feels like an advantage on some of the uh, road courses and street courses, I'd say, and I thought Chevy did a super job at the 500, and everyone's trying to fill in their weaknesses just like the teams do, but um, certainly uh, a huge effort out of Chevrolet. They're fantastic to work with, and, and we, we really enjoy being with them, so uh, can't you know, they, they, I think each company has their own small quirks that are different, just ways of maybe their company cultures that are a little bit different, but um, I think they're both uh, very successful in their own right. You know what I enjoyed, and I realize this is probably not something that Chevrolet or its teams enjoyed, but I enjoyed the fact that Chevy did not win the Manufacturer's Championship this past season, and for one reason, having won all of them in this new twin-turbo V6 era, I like the fact that the brand that has been completely dominant in that capacity, not saying that Chevy's won every driver's manufact or driver championship as well, but at least on the manufacturer side, from 2012 on through 2017, they owned IndyCar, period. I like the fact that any brand that has had that amount of dominance needs to go back to the well and try and you know figure new things out to get back on top Again, had Honda won all and then lost to Chevy, I'd be saying the same thing. But 
I like that. I like the fact that even this far into a, an engine formula, there's still a chance for an upset and still, a ch you know, the need for one brand to go back and figure out how to get back on top. Uh, so I think that's only going to benefit you and the other Chevy powered teams knowing that, you know, for a brand that's already about as hungry as you can get in everything that they do in racing, uh, they're starving, absolutely starving to get back what they didn't want to give away. So I think that's only going to help you all and uh, hopefully make for even more exciting racing next year. Uh, let's go to uh, Nick Dovminiak, who has a, I love this one. He says, Larry, if you could freeze uh, or, or somehow level out damper development, what other areas of the cars would you like to see opened up for development? And he, he also asks, what area do you think would provide the most variety while still giving the smaller teams uh, a chance or the most bang for their buck? So we get this somewhat frequently. Hey, dampers, boy, that's great, uh, but the fans can't see them. Why is that a huge explosive area of free development? So are there any other areas you think that if we could lock down dampers that maybe uh, teams could get into to developing a bit on their own that fans might enjoy or, or get to follow more closely? Boy, it's a great question because it's, uh, I think it's a slippery slope on both sides. I mean, uh, it's with IndyCar racing and the, and the technical side of it, you definitely want to see more things available for the engineers to try and do. But at the same time, I mean, I kind of, totally agree on the damper side I mean especially for us being a team that doesn't have the resources of say a Penske or a Ganassi we certainly feel that that's an area we're trailing in and that's that's a performance loss for us at the moment so some regulation there for us as a team of our size we feel like would be would certainly be a benefit at the same time I think all of us on you know, on street and road courses, we still want to see the cars uh, going faster, and we want to see uh, see competition and team to do a better job, be able to excel. So it's it's tough because right now you've got a really good. I think any team can come in and be successful if they do the right things. Um, but the the damper side's a tough one because that's for us. We are we are really getting into. It, it, uh, well, I'd say we really started last year taking our damper program to the next level. So obviously, we're just behind some of the guys who were able to start that earlier, and, and you know, before we could. So it's um, it's tough because I don't think you want to go back to the days of us making our own suspension and things like that. I just don't think it's stuff we need to be doing, and it it can be expensive. Opening pieces up, yes, yeah, sometimes it, it creates the competition and makes things cheaper. But what you just don't want to get, you know, as a team owner, I don't want to be in a situation where someone has something that I can't get, you mm. know, even if, even if I did have the money to buy it, that it, I just it's not available to me. So that's um, hard. I know Jay's worked hard on that balancing that fine line, and um, the dampers are a part of that as, as an open source. But you know, I don't know. I'd have to think about. It. It's probably a question for the engineers to see what they would want to open up because it's it's a slippery slope either way. I, I agree. I I missed it. I mean, what? How cool are the? I love the old videos of Indy and just people seeing what they would show up. And I listened to my dad talk about the the stuff he engineered, and I crack up. He was telling a story the other day. I mean, just stuff you don't hear. He's like, "Yeah, we were pretty fast at Indy, so everyone was wondering what we were doing." So he said we took a big deer whistle and taped it on the front of the car, and you could hear it whistling when it back. They all wondered what I was cheating on, but it was just a deer whistle. <laughs> Ah, that's brilliant. That yeah, I hope someone wrote nitrous on the side of that deer whistle just to thoroughly confuse people as well. Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, let's go to our pal Kevin Frederico who says, Hey, Larry, has Foyt Racing ever uh, looked at adding another motorsports program back into your efforts alongside IndyCar? And this is noting that obviously you mentioned NASCAR. Uh, there's been a, an IMSA GTP effort back in the day. I mean, uh, as a team, AJ Foyt Enterprises has been involved in a number of racing series. I'm curious if you think you might look to expand into more in the future, or if you think IndyCar is a place to just focus on solely. Well, IndyCar is certainly our top priority. Uh, what I would say is this year I've definitely been taking a hard look at at Indy Lights, at getting back involved in Indy Lights. I know everyone um, is is 
working hard on getting that series back where it needs to be. But for us, uh, I only want to do something if it's going to be a benefit uh, to our main stable, which is the Indy cars. So uh, I feel like on the on the Indy light side, it would be a great place for us to start training young mechanics, uh, getting drivers in the system coming up like, like other teams have done. So Indy Lights makes a lot of sense for us. Um, at the same time, it's just it, it's still a tough tough sell, and uh, we're we're working working on that though. I've looked at sports car stuff. I would love to get with our history of AJ winning the 24 Hours of Daytona and winning Le Mans. It would be awesome to have a presence over in sports car again with the right manufacturer. So just stuff we're kind of dabbling in because. I feel like also that's a place, you know, we were just talking about resources. If you if you can do it properly, then you can continue to build your resources and you just have more smart people in the room that ideas are coming out and, and uh, you can, can work on things to keep her gaining on your performance. So it would just have to be the right deal. I, I definitely don't want to just do anything to do it, but we we are working at it. I'm I don't have a ton of people helping me. It's kind of it's kind of myself working on those types of things right now. But definitely stuff we're looking at. I'd say Indy Lights would probably be the closest avenue that we would look at because I think if we did that, it could benefit the Indy cars. And not obviously asking you to commit to anything here, but when you look at Indy Lights, do you see that as more of a 2020 type thing if you're able to pull everything together for it, or is there not necessarily a date uh, or timeline you've attached to that aspiration? I mean, there's, there's not a date. We've got, you know, we have the space. Uh, I've been talking to some people. I think there is some, some manpower out there, a couple good mechanics and a, and a good engineer that would be able to run an Indy Lights uh, program. So that uh, those kind of things could be in place. It's obviously at this point just a budgeting factor. We We've uh, talked to some people where we're pretty close, I think, but it's still a little bit short. So uh, definitely just not going to commit unless, like I said, if we do it, I don't want it to be a drain on the on the IndyCar Pro. It's, it's got to be a bolster. It's got to help it out. So that's um, – I'd say it's it's a 50-50 at this point for next year, but down the road as we, as we really keep uh, working on feelers and things like that, I think uh, it's a, definitely a possibility. I love the sound of that. We got some. Uh, we got some Houston area uh, education we need with this next question that comes in from Jordan Darwin. Jordan says, "Larry, what are your favorite places to eat around Houston?" He says, "I always enjoy taste of Texas and the uh, Pappas restaurants, especially Papacito. So, uh, give us your culinary suggestions for a visit to uh, Greater Houston." Well, those are some great calls right there. I'll, I'll tell you. Uh Taste of Texas is probably AJ's. It's it's on his top two or three for sure. I know that it's a it's a great place. Um, boy, um, I, I was actually friends with Mary Pappas. Who unfortunately, passed away last year in the in the Pappas restaurant. So we love all the Pappas restaurants for sure. The old Pappas Steakhouse on Westheimer is one of my favorites, and one of my longtime favorite steakhouses is from actually when I lived up in Fort Worth and went to TCU was was Del Frisco's. I would uh, save save up every month to try to go to Del Frisco's <laughs> once. And every once in a while, you know, I had the emergency credit card that, that Dad had given me, you know, for emergencies. he called, what the hell does Del Frisco charge on here? It doesn't sound like an emergency. <laughs> so, uh, Del Frisco's is a longtime favorite of mine. But, boy, Houston has great restaurants. And um, I'd say uh, he's got some good ones. All the Pappas restaurants, Taste of Texas, and Del Frisco's brilliant got this question in a couple different ways so i'll go with the one uh, sent in from uh, mark via twitter and two questions one aj has a ton of old superstitions which of these do you also uh, carry on or believe in you know nothing colored green no peanuts at the track etc and also what do you miss most about the speedway motel he says the club sandwich uh walking around georgetown saturday night or or pranking young anthony so curious about the uh, any continuation of superstitions in the team these days, and any thoughts about uh, the old Speedway Motel? <laughs> Those are great questions for Bart. Um, I tell you, I uh, Green is probably the one I've stuck to the most. Really? Throughout the years, you will not see me wearing any green 
at, at a racetrack. I, I don't know why, just it, it was always around. I remember, you'll remember the Conseco car was yeah, great. Oh, we, it we was always, very. Yep. And, uh, and someone said something to AJ about it. He said, well, the money's green, too. <laughs> <So> <laughs> said, yeah, good point. And, uh, but I, I still, yeah, I, don't, I definitely don't wear any green um, around the racetrack. And anyone that comes, it's a guest of mine, I usually tell them the same thing. So that is an old superstition I've always kind of stuck with. Wow. Uh, the old motel, boy, <laughs> I, do, uh, I do miss that. I, I remember, yeah, my... A couple of years I ran at Indy, and Anthony and I would always stay at the motel. And uh, so, if you remember anybody who stayed at the old motel, most of the rooms had an adjoining room. Yep. And we would, I do remember one night after we qualified uh, for the race, and Anthony had got out, we got out, and I got home before he did. So, we, uh, we broke into his room and I think we put the air condition as low as it would go and stole all his sheets. And I walked in there the next morning and he was curled up in a ball, freezing to death. <laughs> and, uh, it was pretty funny, but we did. And one time we, uh, I know one time we ran down to the, uh, the motel had the bar down there and we got, uh, we, uh, they had a stand up of Van Weldon and we grabbed it and we, uh, hit, turned to kind of hit it in Anthony's room to where he walked in to the bathroom. He said it scared the hell out of him. So we did have a lot of fun, uh, pranking around the old speedway. A lot of good times. Well, we got to stay there a couple times before it was, uh, before it stopped being a thing, unfortunately. But yeah, it just felt like taking part in a great, great cr- tradition. Let's go to uh, CM-16, who asks you to rate Mateus Leist's rookie season. Well, you know, I think, and Mateus will, will tell you as well, it was, it was frustrating because it started with so much promise. Yeah. Gosh, I mean, we were we were P one, and the you know the first session there at St. Pete, it was like wow, you know, and, uh, it was it was great, and qualified third, and um, we had the we had the issue in the race, but uh, and he he showed a lot of speed at Phoenix. Obviously, that was a big step going on the on this first oval from the IndyCar, but um, just as a team from there. It seemed like after Indy, we just started to lose performance. We knew for some reason at Barber, just the permanent road course, our our baseline setup was not good last year. It wasn't really good anywhere we went. Uh, I think Tony felt like at uh, at the Indy GP, he had a decent car, but I think that's about really it on the, on the permanent road courses. We just could not, just didn't have it figured out, and um, that's something we're really looking at this year. But I think what happens, especially with a rookie, with the season starting well and there was a lot of confidence, and then as you start to struggle a little bit, I think he just lost some confidence, and and you just it gets away from you a little bit, and and the frustration sets in, and then you start trying to force it instead of just letting it happen. So so from there, that was that was a frustration. Um, the kid's got a, a ton of talent, oh, yeah. and I think this year he's just going to benefit now from driven an Indy car at all the tracks. He's going to be able to really help push the setup more in the directions of what he wants and what he knows. And I think you saw of all this, you know, just of IndyCar in the whole, it's tough for rookies. They'll have places where they show the flashes, but I think if, when you look at the final standings, none of the rookies were way up there i mean correct me if i'm wrong but for, it just it's it's tough uh, week in week out for rookies because there's so much depth in the talent in indycar right now that it's hard to just nail it the the first year i mean obviously wickens was fantastic but it, you can't call him a rookie either he was you know there was a plethora of experience there and, and he's certainly a special talent did an awesome job but uh mateus i think is going to be great we're really excited to uh, excited about the future for him let me ask this follow-up i mean one of the the things about mateus coming out of indy lights uh, was incredible pace the kid is certainly as brave as they come great personality as well if there was one box that had yet to be ticked it was on the development and, and setup side it's just every driver no driver two drivers are at the same stage at the same time of learning setup, learning to develop a car to its peak, 
it just one of the things that came with Mateus out of lights was that's definitely an area he's going to need to improve as his IndyCar uh, career starts to build. What sense did you get, Larry, as the season went on that Mateus was starting to be a, a bigger contributor and able to help working in, in concert with Tony Kanon to raise that part of the team's game too? Yeah, I mean, that's something, you know, and Tony, what we what we started to do also was put, uh, like when we've done a couple of these tests here, we get, uh, make sure Mateus can hear Tony's audio and just Tony's feedback of, hey, okay, this is, this is the kind of stuff the engineer needs to hear. You know, this is the kind of information you need to be working on giving the engineer so that so that he can make your car better. And that's just, it takes time. It, it just takes a little time. And uh, Mateus is such a young guy. I mean, my goodness, he's, he's, he just turned 20 years old. So, uh, and, and, you know, he hasn't been in cars all that long. But even, you know, watching him in Indy Lights and the success he had there, but even going back before that, we had an eye on him. We knew some people he drew for, drove for over in Europe who said, this kid's a special talent, you know, so uh, really keep an eye on him. And um, uh, I think this year he, he needs to take a big step up in that feedback department, and I, and I think he will. Uh, we're working a lot with him in the simulator and doing just a lot of big changes that he can feel things and working on the feedback, and he's doing a really good job with it. So I'm excited, uh, you know, really excited to see how he matures next season. No, I love that kid. Uh, he just brings a lot of character, uh, has a lot of potential. I mean, there, there's just there's nothing but good stuff there. Uh, next question, somewhat related. This comes in from our pal Ari Fawn, who says, Larry, how's the dynamic between Tony Kanon and Mateus? Are there any good stories you can share from the past year about those two crazy Brazilians who are at the opposite ends of their careers? They, uh, Tony's been great. You know, we, we had... We... We, we have a lot of laughs for sure um, out, you know racing you have to everyone works so hard and there's so much stress that you have to have, find time to laugh too and have a good time so uh, we definitely have that dynamic going on which is hard not to have with Tony but obviously we have a lot of good fun with Mateus's hair and uh, him being a young kid Tony's always on him and, uh, it's a great dynamic uh, it obviously helps with them both being you know countrymen I think they there's respect for each other out of that so Tony wants him to really do well and you know we're hoping that Tony's a part of our team for a long time uh, I hope he wants to keep driving for a while but even after that I think you've seen veterans uh, like what Dario does with Chip and Rick Mears at Penske where they stay on and help the younger guys come up and just that, that knowledge and experience base is, is great for, for any team. So we're hoping Tony you know, stays around and is with us for a long time. Him and AJ are a hoot, but uh, it's good except when they start talking Portuguese. I'm like, God, it's better that, you know, I don't know if y'all talking about me or what. You know, I, I guess since Vitor, there's been a, enough. I, I should have, uh, in, in Felipe, I, I should have learned Portuguese by now. Well, I've, I've just made time to make sure that I know the Portuguese words for either fat, stupid, a, you know, a variety of those things that I hear at least spoken in English about me, so I at least want to know, you know, at least I can go like, okay, yeah, they're, they're speaking the truth there. Uh, let's see, let's go to uh, our last general question. This comes in from Jeff Markowski, who brings us back to the topic of young Anthony, asking whatever happened to him. He says he seemed to uh, drop off the face of the earth a little while ago so how is the lad doing i mean I, I seem to recall there was an indy 500 uh appearance maybe last year the year before but uh we haven't seen him for a little bit well i think with all those kids he's pretty busy <laughs> <laughs> so uh no i think anthony's doing great i mean obviously we we have the wine business together which we have a lot of fun with and with the the wine bar open there and in, in speedway now is a great spot and he He's really involved in, in helping run that. But, um, man, he's just, I think, really enjoying being a father. Uh, him and Casey, are they, they're uh, just great parents. And little A.J., you know, uh, A.J. the fifth, he is uh, quite the hockey player. So wow. I think nowadays Anthony is uh, pretty busy being a hockey dad. Well, that, that, that is great, great to hear. 
All right, let's move to our next category, which is about a certain Anthony Joseph Foyt, uh, one AKA Super Tex, and probably not a surprise to have folks asking about uh, the the wonderful patron of the team, and also so, someone who's clearly played a pretty important role in your life as well. Uh, let's go with Howard Bennett again. We'll uh, we'll go with to Larry. Just how good is AJ on his uh, on the bulldozer that he owns? He says, does uh, he do the complete work, stripping, slot dozing, shaping, final grade and trim, etc., or does somebody else have to finish it off for him? And uh, does he now have an air condition or a bee-proof cab fitted to the bulldozer? <laughs> well, he did. He did get a new tractor last year with the with the enclosed cab and air condition to keep the. I mean, I, I tell you what, those. Uh, about those bees that's something uh i know he does not wish upon anybody and uh and getting them twice you know that's just unbelievable he is uh one tough son of a gun i tell you but uh he just loves it i mean it's it's been his relaxation i know when he bought our, his first ranch i think was in i want to say it was 77 when he bought what we refer to as a main ranch uh kind of not far here from the race shop which is why he ended up building a shop out this way in, in 1999 so uh, he just sold that he sold that ranch though not uh, just a couple of years ago and um, it's just as Houston is spread out and the, the taxes get higher you know he just felt like it was something it was time to time to sell it but he he just always said he said that was uh, his relaxation to get away from the the stress and the busyness of the racing it was just one way to clear his head and and he loves kind of beautifying a property he still does it he'll buy a piece of land and he'll clean clean up the brush and leave the pretty trees and uh what what we have to keep him from but he keeps trying to make the lakes bigger but he keeps getting left too close so <laughs> he uh he put another one in the water a couple of weeks ago i don't know if you know about that yeah but... <laughs> robin told me that there was another uh we need to put flotation devices on uh the, the heavy earth moving equipment for sure but he loves it, you know. He, he does. It's uh, he's just you know he's he's a doer. He's not he, he's just not a sit at home type of guy. And uh, amazing that he's still out there doing it whenever he can. So let's go to uh, Michael Goodyear. Interesting question here, Michael. Thanks for sending this in. He says, "Could Larry speak about the first time you realized uh, the legend that is Anthony Joseph Foyt?" He says, do you recall a moment when you had a particular realization of the family name that you carry? Uh, and it wasn't just, you know, AJ being dad, but whoa, that's one of the greatest drivers to ever get behind the wheel of a race car. You know, that's a, that's a good question because I'd say, um, some friends of mine said when I was a kid, it was funny. I was always kind of bragging on him. And I, I remember bringing some trophies to show and tell and things like that and, um, you know, for me, when I was young, the Indianapolis left such, such an impression. And I would always race morning, wake up, and wait for, for him because I would go over from the Speedway Motel to the track with him and just to hear all the people yelling for him and cheering him on and rooting him on. I mean, as a kid, it was really left a huge impression. But truly appreciating what he accomplished, I probably didn't fully understand and embrace that until I started driving myself and realizing that this just isn't easy. It's just, this isn't every, doesn't just come for everybody. And, um, you know, then you just start to realize, holy cow, what he really accomplished. When you start looking at the records, it is, it is truly unbelievable. And, um, yeah, pretty pretty amazing when you really start to think about it. If a young driver were to look at AJ's record, or let me rephrase that, if there was a young person aspiring to become an IndyCar driver who looked at AJ's record first, they might decide not to get involved in the sport if they had any desire to, you know, I want to become the best ever, or I want to break all the records... You know, his is one of those things that you look at where you go, yeah, maybe I'm going to be an accountant. I might be able to be the world's best accountant. I don't know if I could ever uh, match what AJ has achieved throughout his career, open wheel career, stock, you name it, everything that he's driven. If you compile everything that man has done in a motor racing vehicle with or without a roof, 
Yeah. Uh, that would be depressing if one had a desire to be the world's best, because I think he might be holding on to uh, those records for a really, really long time. Uh, let's see. Let's go to a... We've answered kind of one or two other AJ questions uh, through... Uh, some of your answers or responses already, Larry. Let's go to a last one here that comes in from Joshua Chrome. <laughs> it says, Larry, are you as indestructible as AJ seems to be, or is it an unbreakable type situation where you aren't so lucky? He also says, please don't test this, seri- this theory if you aren't sure. <laughs> well, hell no. I'm definitely not as tough as AJ. I can tell you that right now. He's, uh, <laughs> they broke the mold with him. Um, but, um, I'll tell you what is what's really great is I think his his and I's relationship is is really strong right now. I mean, there were times where when I was still driving that it was pretty you know between us it was just tough because he was he was wanting more out of me and I was wanting more out of the team. But I think that helped me realize what I felt like as a driver what I didn't have and what as I came into this role and started working for the team, what we needed, uh, or what I felt we needed to be successful. But what's been awesome is he is as old school as probably, well, as he, as he is, he's, he's definitely old school, but you would be surprised. Um, it, it's taken a little time, but he understands change. And as much as we laugh, everybody talks about him throwing the computer at Indy when uh, when they ran out of fuel there, and and his his dislike for computers. He gets he understands the necessity. He gets it. Uh, I mean, it's amazing that if you would have told me ten years ago that right now we were going to be an IndyCar team with with eight full time engineers. Or, <laughs> uh, you, I would have you said no way AJ will ever go for that. But he uh, he really has been great to work with on this side. I love working with him, and he just wants to win. He knows it's tough, and uh, but he he's really start really letting us do what we got to do. To, you know, technology wise, I think we're we're headed the right direction. He's a big part of that. Let's move into our next section here. We had a couple of folks, clearly big fans of the team, inquiring about what it's going to take to get uh, the program back to where you want it to be. I've got a couple of general questions, a couple of more specific ones. So we'll just go general here to start from Thomas Gross, who asks, what was the biggest contributing factor to the team not performing as well as you would have hoped in 2018. Are there any things you've identified post-season where you said, okay, key areas to fix? Or do you think it's just a case of, hey, we truly just shook the whole can here, new drivers, new engineer, technical director, etc. Just curious if there was improvements that stood out, Larry, or if you think the season went about as expected with all the changes in mind. Well, I think where we, with the new Aero kits, everybody was you know, taking um, taking a little bit. You know, everybody was trying to develop this new aero kit, and what what can we do to make the drivers comfortable with it? Because it certainly had some challenges, which which I thought was great. You know, and, and it was a big talking point at the beginning of the year, and which drivers were going to be able to adapt their style, or whose style was going to fit, and then what what teams were going to hit the setups right. And uh, we came out of the box actually. I felt like above where I thought we would be. Mm. I knew with Tony we would be, we should be competitive with Tony and Eric Cowden on the ovals, certainly at Indianapolis. And we put, I'm going to say 80% of our development into winning the Indy 500 last year. We just knew that was going to be an opportunity for us. And it showed, I think. It was, for me, as long as I've been involved on on the team side, uh, our best month of May. We were just consistently fast all month and uh, had a chance to win the race if it wasn't for a flat tire. So that, uh, from that side, was successful. Um, on the other side, what happened after Indy, for some reason, I think we were going down some paths, uh, maybe with our setups, uh, maybe on the damper side, that we felt we were headed in the right direction, but as it turns out, maybe we weren't. So it's been a big push as we work on our you know, the tools we use to analyze some of these things to see, okay, where did we go off track here? 
did we get worse or did other people get better and we didn't keep up? So, you know, that's the stuff uh, that the engineers are working full time on right now and, and trying to find ways to, it doesn't take much, you know, you can be off, uh, a couple tenths of a second and it can feel it can feel like a long way in, in IndyCar and that's what's crazy and you can see session to session how cars go up and down but no doubt we're against some amazing teams I mean when you have Penske and Ganassi and Andretti and uh, Schmidt and all these teams are very good I mean every team in IndyCar um, Dale's done a great job of stepping up his program uh, the Harding group's going to be tough next year every, there, there's just no one out there that is, is slouching. Everyone is pouring every resource they can into it, and uh, and we're doing the same thing. And everybody's just trying to. It's tough, you know. No doubt, it's just very difficult, and you've got to hit everything right to have a successful weekend. No easy outs in IndyCar. That is uh, that is for sure. Let's see. Let's go to. I mean, you answered a, a lot of the things that Matthew Pope asked about as well. Here's one from Brian Smith, and I don't. I might be a little bit off on this uh, if there have been changes coming in this area too. But Brian says, Larry, you you were running uh, cars out of two separate shops, one in Texas, one in Indy. Uh, is it a good thing for the team's performance to have cars spread out that way? And what complications have come from having shops in two separate places? Well, what I'd say was it's had its pluses and negatives you know I, th- I think it's had some positives some negatives but it's certainly not ideal i mean we knew that going in but uh we have such a good core group of of guys here in texas that are rooted here and and so we also were able to get some great guys up in indy that made sense to just go ahead and have tony's car up there uh tony moved up to indy uh his engineering staff is was pretty rooted up there and and and, you know, not really interested in moving to Texas. So it just left us in a tough spot to where uh, running the two shops is what we need to do. But, um, again, it's not ideal. I, do I think it hurts performance? I don't know. I don't, I don't want to say it hurts performance because I think it's allowed us to get the best people available to, to join AJ Foyt Racing. And so we're happy with that. And uh, I think logistically it just takes a little bit – uh, more planning. We just have to stay on top of things and and make sure that all the parts and pieces are, are moving in the right direction. So it's uh, maybe just a little extra work, but in the grand scheme of things, I think it's been a benefit. And uh, we'll see what happens in the future. I'm, I'm not going to say we'd ever move everything to Indy or when would things move back to Texas. I, I just don't know, so I can't speculate on that. But it's... Um, it's it, it's a, just a little bit of a logistical uh, headache of staying on top of it, but uh, the guys work really hard and do a good job at it. Keith Lee says, Hey, Larry, if the team had a huge injection of funds that was suddenly available on top of what you already have, what would be the main area of focus you would spend that money on? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, actually, you know, I think we were talking on it right now. Obviously, the obvious open area of development is dampers. So if you could just uh, continue to really explore as we're into these inertia dampers and, and continue to explore that, um, I think the way that works with the uh, – Third, you know, third spring systems on on these cars right now is kind of the ticket to where the speed is and, and the, where the guys are doing a uh, finding that little bit of grip to to help them uh, go to the next level. So it's that's certainly a that an open area of development that teams are spending a lot of money right now on, and I don't think you could put a cap on that area because the, the Indy car field is so close, and like like we were talking about, it sometimes just. It's if you if you think if you can get that little bit of grip in, in each corner, that's gonna gonna give you another half a second. Uh, it can show big dividends. Last question here on on team evolution and improvement for next season comes in from David Nixick, and I'm gonna modify this one a little bit because we covered the ground this ground to some degree. So you'd mentioned Larry that at least for 2018, about you know, roughly 80 percent of the off-season effort was to try and win at Indy. 
looking at trying to close the gap to the Andretti's and Ganassi's and Penske's and so on, is there a particular mindset or strategy on, hmm, do we increase that percentage of our overall effort to give us an even better shot at Indy? Do we pull back on that percentage so we maybe have more success on the Barbers, the uh, mid Ohio, you know, pick the road and street courses? Just curious mindset while you're trying to shorten that gap, how your your mindset works on trying to get there, and if there's any greater or lesser area of uh, event focus. I'd say the off-season mindset uh, has a, a few things, but you certainly don't want to lose anything at Indy, uh, but we're not having to, we're still working on things that are certainly related to Indy, but it's very important for us to find I think, a better base package for um, probably the permanent road courses most importantly. I think our street course setup is is in a decent starting point. We, we showed some good pace at, at some of the street courses. So if we can continue to take that baseline, uh, continue to improve our, our grip level through through the dampers in that situation, uh, I think we can be better there. But uh, And we're also working on finding that uh, baseline setup for the permanent road courses so that we can be more consistent week to week. Um, those are, are pretty much the big areas of focus, I'd say, in this off season. And then, and then obviously, we're working on getting even better uh, pit stop practice cars, getting the guys on uh, higher uh, workout schedules, uh, just more, just improving every aspect of the team, uh, even the way we look, and getting um, some of our equipment just uh, updated and the best stuff that we can, just to where everything looks and feels the way we want it to be. So it's a work in progress. It always is. And but uh, the guys are really working hard this winter. It, it was nice. Uh, I tell you, it was nice knowing we're going to have consistency yeah. on the engineer side. We're having consistency on the driver side. So we can just keep working on what we're working on instead of, as you know, like for us, we had a lot of change over the last three or four years that has hurt us, whether it was uh, manufacturer change or driver change and things like that. So, so this level of consistency is nice and letting us work on some of the detailed things that as a team that we need to focus on. That's the thing I'm happiest about and the thing I'm looking forward to the most is knowing that you're going to have stability across your drivers, your engineering ranks, just on so many levels instead of having to figure out how to work together you know, with this new group. It, it's a it's just part and parcel of the sport, that change, but it's really nice when an organization like yours, Larry, that's been through a lot of change recently, can say, all right, <laughs> we can plan ahead. We know this is our group. We believe in this group. And year two, year three, however many years on of having more or less the same core group, that should be the thing that really does deliver the most improvement. I know it might sound non-specific to uh, to some folks, but of course we're going to be working on all kinds of development things behind the scenes, blah blah blah. But the fact that we can build consistency among, within the team, that right there usually accounts for a pretty significant year-to-year improvement. Then of course you have the fact that your competitors are also improving from year to year, so. It's not as if they stand still to let you, you know, catch up or move ahead, but uh, sticking together is pretty much always uh, the recipe for improvement when you have good foundation beneath you, like you do. Absolutely. No, no, you're spot on, and that's the thing. You you always, that's what, uh, in the off-season, when everybody's not really testing together and you're not sure exactly what everyone's up to and you try to do and improve and you always feel good when you unload at St. Pete but you know everybody else is working working super hard as well so I mean it's part of the fun of competition that's what I, I love about racing really is the competition let's move to our last section here got a couple questions to close fun and good stuff here on your driving career uh, so you and I have had a chance to to do some fun conversations and stories from time to time on Larry Foyt, race car driver. So I figure let's close the episode with this. First one comes in from Chuck Knob, who says, Larry, what is your fondest or proudest moment behind the wheel of a race car? Oh, I don't know. Um, I mean, my career was, 
you know, pretty brief, and it just really it happened so quickly. You know, I was in I was in college and, and racing go karts when I could, and then um, you know the next year I was in ASA, and the next year I was in the Bush Series. So it was just <laughs> really some pretty large jumps. But um, ASA was a lot of fun. I loved working with Butch Miller. Uh, you know, my first time driving a stock car and to to win the pole at uh, at Winchester and break Mark Martin's record there in ASA was probably a highlight of that year and then you know they just I was super happy to be able to uh, race in the Daytona 500 to be able to race in the Indy 500 and, and the Brickyard 400 but I think just a moment for me was probably the first time I pulled off of pit lane in an Indy car at, at Indianapolis and to look at our family suite up in turn two because of all the years of being a kid, you know, I've never missed an Indy 500. Um, even when I ran the Coke 600 or I uh, flew up and watched Anthony start the race and then flew back to Charlotte and, and raced Charlotte that night in the, in the stock car. But um, to pull out on an Indy car and look up in turn two where I sat every year to watch uh, Dad race and watch Anthony race was, boy, it was, uh, for me, certainly a moment. Wow. Well, let's see. We got two more for you here. Uh, we'll go to the next from Tim Falkowitz, who says, "Larry, how did driving race cars prepare you for your current role with the team, and was this planned from the beginning, or something that evolved over time?" Well, I'd say um, no. I, you know, when I was younger and, and wanting to race, and you you hope you don't think about your when your career will. And at least I wasn't. I was just thinking about the future. And, uh, you know, it was kind of strange when I ended up going over to NASCAR. But then I, I, you know, I was hoping to have a long career there. You just don't know um, how it's all going to play out. But I always thought in the future of kind of taking my, you know, my dad's path of driving and then being on the team owner side. Um, just didn't really know when that would happen or how that would happen. But uh, to his question, I'd say it definitely helps you. It helps in a lot of ways just uh, to be able to, what the drivers are saying, you just kind of have a relation. You know, you, you know that feeling of what they're feeling. So it's it's really cool to have that. And um, kind of like I said earlier, I just felt like I knew what I thought I didn't have in my career that would have helped uh, me be more successful on the team side. And that's what I've come in um with the ABC team and tried to implement and and just kind of fought hard for uh, some of the things that I thought uh, we needed to, to be successful. So um, in a nutshell, I guess that's kind of where I, I think it did certainly help uh, uh, help out on um, being a driver, giving you that experience for sure. All right, we're going to close the show with a question from Jeff Hildebrand. Uh, thank you, Jeff. This is a perfect closer. Uh, let's start with, he has two questions for you. Let's start with one. He says, who's the best technical driver you've ever worked with on ovals? Oh, that is a good question. Um, you know, I I think, I think Tony Kanan probably has uh, the most feel of what he wants on an oval. Um I, you know, I, I was on with Mateus more this year than Tony, so uh, some of Tony's feedback I didn't hear as much as Mateus's um, on the technical side. But I think Tony on the feel on an oval knows what he wants as a feel, but I think technically probably Takuma. I mean, Takuma was uh, a very technical driver, obviously coming from Formula One and his experience there and just his whole mindset. Uh, he's very involved on the technical side. Uh, more so than almost any driver I've ever seen. Uh, so technically, I'd probably have to say Takuma, probably more involved than anybody. Nice. All right. Well, the primary question from Jeff, which I love, uh, we'll close on. He says, Larry, what was more painful in 2004 at Indy? Hitting the wall in turn two or the look AJ gave you and, and, and AJ the, the fourth in the paddock after finishing 32nd and 33rd? <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Oh, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, yeah I appreciate it. Thanks, that. pal. That was, uh, whew, yeah, that was a tough one. You know, that was um, 
so that was my rookie year. And what was hard, I know AJ was so nervous about, I think, even my experience level. I didn't really run in traffic much until carb day. I was like, oh, my God, this is a whole different animal than just qualifying and, and driving here. So uh, it was a lot to learn. And, yeah, I remember uh, Anthony crashed early, and I was like, oh, man. And um, I think we had a – and I was actually just running around. I had a Toyota that year. I think we struggled for speed with yeah. the Toyota. So I could flat-foot it around there, but the Honda guys were fast. And uh, I remember we had a rain delay, which was great because I was able to kind of get out of the car and just digest everything because um, it was uh, you know, it was a, quite a new experience for me. But then when we were running again, and the car was handling fine – but I think it was Tony Kanan leading the thing. I was laughing, and I was like, oh, man, you know, here comes the leader, and I made the classic rookie mistake at Indy of giving him too much room, and you get up in the marbles, and, and the thing just takes off on you. And uh, so it wasn't a crash that really hurt, uh, more just hurt my feelings, and I was disappointed in crashing. But I, I learned a, a lesson, and, and that's why you'll see guys at Indianapolis, and it's always – important even if you're if you're you know if, if a guy's faster than you you've got to close that door uh getting down and that's something you know even uh, spoke with Mateus a lot because where you see the lights guys at Indy be able to run that second groove it doesn't exist in an Indy car once you've got a stint uh, full of marbles up there and so that was a, a learning lesson for me but um no I'd say the 05 hurt worse when I broke my back at turn one uh, that yeah. that hurt was probably that hit was the worst because and I had slowed down because I knew something was wrong and slowed down but that thing still snapped so fast that it was uh, hit straight backwards and I think that's what what hurt the most. Oh Lord, Larry, as always, you know how much I appreciate the time that you make for me with whatever we do to try and uh, cover the sport. So thank you for taking some time here, being our guest this week on the Week in IndyCar presented by Cooper Tires, and looking forward to hopefully a very strong and competitive 2019 season for you and the ABC Supply team. Well, we're working on it. We appreciate it. And thanks uh, to everyone who wrote in a question. And uh, thanks for cheering for that uh, the 4 and the 14. We hope to see them in victory lane this year.